Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is stuff. I forgot there was a camera. This is Tim Ferriss. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of the Tim Ferriss Show. We have, yet again, the random show. Yes. Kev, Kev, Rose, Rose. Kevin Rose. Thank you for having me, Tim. It's good to be here. It's good to be here in we're, your home. We're in we're in a, a home. <laughs> we, we have our matching mini scooters. We do. We yeah. also have a miniature kitchen set behind us. We were making pinto beans and homestyle ice cream. Yes. You may or may not be able Which to see that. <laughs> their favorite topping for pinto beans. And My, by then, he means his progeny. I have a couple little ones that hopefully will not be making an appearance and have gone to bed, but we shall see. We, we already had, had a princess on the run, a <laughs> yeah. little jailbreak who came flying through. So, Kevin, before recording, actually while recording, you said, this is the important juice, but yes. that was off mic, so I relayed it into the mic. What is this important juice that we have before us? So, I mean, we've been doing these shows for a very long time. Super and we've long. always, well, not always, we've, we've highlighted some of our favorite drinks over the years. Mm-hmm. and one of the things that I comes into my possession about once a year is a limited edition run. <laughs> you know, it's expensive when it's in passive, passive <laughs> sentence form yeah. comes into my possession. That's right. It sounds very <laughs> fancy. It's, it's just a beer people. So one of the things that I like to do, and we've talked about this before at, at some point, but unlike wine, the cool thing about beer is you can buy the best beer in the world, like the number one ranked beer, and it's going to cost you $100. Yeah. That's not the case with wine, obviously. No. So in terms of different styles of beer, obviously, it's typically not IPAs that win the number one slot on that. It's, it's some of the heavier stuff. But on the IPA front, the second highest rank IPA by Beer Advocate, and I would argue the harder to find version of, of the IPAs because the number one ranked IPA is called Heady Topper mm-hmm. and it is in production year round. This particular beer by Russian River Brewing is called Pliny the Younger. Now, you may have heard of Pliny the Elder, which is you typically find at Whole Foods and things like that. The Younger is a limited edition run that they do once a year and just they used to have to go to Russian River Brewing to actually consume it. Mm. And just recently, probably I'd say three or four years ago, they started putting it in bottles. Mm-hmm. So this is it in bottle form. I would argue that this is probably the most sought after IP in the world. It is $75 a bottle. So it's not cheap. It is a 16 ounce bottle though. So per ounce. Nope. It's a, it was one pint. Yeah. One pint. So it's, it's expensive juice, but it is it quite good. And I wanted to share it with you. Thank you. And I also want to tell people out there how to find the rarest beers in the world. Let's do it. I may have mentioned this at one crazy long ago random show, but there is a place that I go to called mybeercollectibles.com. This is an ad. I have nothing to do with them. I, <laughs> every time I mention any URL, you're in the <laughs> same Check boat. out code KevKev2023. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Make sure you get my 20%. But w- one of the things that... that is, this is I'm probably going to get them arrested, but one of the things that is... <laughs> very difficult to do is to sell alcohol online. Yeah. And so on the beer front, if you say, and and this is true, if you were to drink this bottle, you can sell the bottle by itself for, let's just say $5 or whatever it may be, because the bottle is just collectible in its own right. And so what they claim is that everything you're buying is a collectible. (laughs) And so you're not actually (laughs) buying the beer. And so it's a, it's a peer to peer marketplace. Yeah. And so they have people that go and buy that. I've been using them for several years now. They're going to have the best month of sales before they get shut down. <laughs> it's going to be really a blaze of glory. They've been okay. They've been okay. And, and they always, I always find really good sellers on there. And you see on the side of this, it says, you know, not packaged for resale. So you have to right. know somebody to get this. And yeah, I, I love a good IPA. And I would say this is, this is up there. This is pretty, pretty good stuff. So you know the wine world, you know probably something about the beer world. You also know the high end, I'm not even gonna call them watches, God forbid, timepiece world. Sure. Very well. How much of the degree of scarcity, or not scarcity, how much of the fame that comes from being sought after is derived from the quality of the product mm. versus the scarcity versus the positioning. If there is such a thing, marketing other factors. Yeah. I've become really interested in this question and there's actually a spectacular episode. I haven't listened to it yet on LVMH and the building of that right. from it's very meager beginnings to it's insane current state and the, 
there's a book called How Luxury Lost Its Luster. So a lot of mm. alliteration, which I read a long time ago. I do find the the, the study of sort of scarcity yes. and high-end products very interesting. Have you read the book, The Luxury Strategy? The Luxury of Strategy? No, it's Luxury Strategy. The Luxury Strategy. I was like, The Luxury of Strategy. It seems like a necessity. No, I haven't. It's actually another really good one. It talks about just brand positioning and just how to set yourself up as a, you know, a really sought premier. after yeah, premier brand. Huh. And some of the mistakes that brands make where they go down market and they become a commoditized kind of like, you know, raw stress for less. Mm -hmm. It's part of the reason why the fashion industry goes and destroys so many clothes. Like it's not because they have leftover clothes. They could go and sell them. You know, it's what happened to Guess, Jeans, or any of these other brands where they said, hey, we have this extra inventory. Let's discount it. Let's do outlet stores. Right. Let's do you know these these discounting stores. And then, and they, it get, then the they get anchored in the mid market. Exactly. And, and then you can't done. go back up. Right. Once you go down, you can't you, you can't regain that. Well, we chart. are we are, and there's so many ways, different ways to differentiate. Right. As one example, we're in LA right now, and I had never been to Erewhon. Mm. So for people who don't know, Erewhon is a very famous. Very expensive. <laughs> it's not expensive. This is well, water. Let me paint a picture. I went in and I went to their hot meal cafeteria line and I got a, a couple of boxes. I mean, it's two meals, maybe two and yeah. a half meals for me. And I was like, oh, I got a kombucha too. And, you know, maybe a water. And I think that was about it. There wasn't much more to it. And it was $147. I wanted to go there just for the spectacle because. I mean, there's a dating scene there as there's well. There's a dating scene. <laughs> it's, yeah. The point I was going to make is I was having a conversation with someone and I told them this story and they said, wow, that's insane. I imagine if you took the same inventory, you could sell it for 20% less and do really well. And I said, you could, but if Erewhon lowered their prices, they would be dead. I think, right? Because the part of the allure, part of the story, part of the word of mouth is how expensive it is. Yeah, I mean, it's that, but also Erewhon's, we could get into Erewhon. I mean, look, they have other stuff that is, I'm sure, of incredibly high quality, and I, I, yeah. I respect that also. But the reason I hear about Erewhon in a place like Austin or other places in the country is highly exclusive, very expensive. Yeah. And I'm not saying that as a knock, right? Right. Well, I think it's it's what we've seen. Well, it, it, just talking about grocery stores, even though this isn't that most that interesting of a topic, but like, but well, this maps to a bunch of other things. Oh, I, for sure. Yeah. But like, I think when when you see Whole Foods get bought by Amazon mm -hmm. and it becomes this kind of mass scaled enterprise, although it was you could argue beforehand. Yeah. When you go in there, it's not the level of quality it was a decade ago. It's just not like it's it's been it's been mm -hmm. degraded, and like this is now that next new level, right? Yeah. And it's not. I would say that when you go into Air One, it doesn't feel bougie though. It doesn't feel like crazy, like just luxury for luxury's sake. It's okay. just like wild. Is that what you mean by bougie? Because that word it gets I've uh, I've heard bougie said more times than I can count since I got to LA about a week ago. I think it's it's just kind of like it the one thing I've only been in LA a few months, and the one thing that I love about it actually is that it's a choose your own adventure. Yeah. So you can go as crazy high end as you want to whatever you want to that however you define that. Or you can find an awesome little dive bar with a yeah. great cocktail, right? Mm -hmm. And so I actually like that. And like for me, I tend to like float somewhere in the middle. Like, don't get me wrong, I like a nice, awesome steak at a great killer steakhouse, which they have a lot of those out here. Yeah. But at the same time, it's like it, it's it's different than Portland. Like Portland, we didn't have the high end; we had a lot of the middle. Mm -hmm. So it's like Erwan is is very small. It's a very small grocery. It's super store. small. I was actually expecting it to be much larger. Yeah. So I go there. And I've been there since. And it is high quality. The food yeah. is high quality. I think the name is also, if I'm getting this right, an anagram of nowhere for people who may be wondering mm, about the name. Interesting. The experience that I had actually yesterday brought a lot of this to top of mind for me. And my experience yesterday was going to this place called the Magic Castle for the second oh, time nice. ever. you went. I did. And for those who don't know about the Magic Castle, I'm not going to do it justice but it is the mecca of magic in the sense that people from all over the world, the kids who become obsessed with magic, sleight of hand, illusion, etc., the one place, if they've heard of it, that everyone wants to go is the Magic Castle. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's anyone, more or less, in that world blows through the doors probably once a year. Did you dress up? 
you have to dress yeah, up. You have to this wear is tie, where right? I was going. You have to wear a suit and tie. Mm-hmm. Not just a tie, suit and tie. I did not come here with a suit and tie, <laughs> nor did I come here with dress shoes. So a friend of mine who was visiting, who also didn't have any of the fancy clothes, because the opportunity to go came up very last yeah. minute. Men's warehouse. We went to Hollywood Suits on Hollywood Boulevard. You rented? No, we couldn't rent, so we bought suits. But here's the thing. From the moment we walked in, and I know these are, these are like quality problems, right? The fact that you can buy a suit that you never intend to wear again is kind of insane. But I knew that it would cost close to the same to rent and that we didn't have time to rent because literally we found out that we had the opportunity to go to this amazing show. It's a very small show with an incredible magician who I'll mention here because the show is absolutely spectacular and then I'll rewind. So I'm going to get his name probably pronounced wrong, but Simon Coronel, C-O-R-O-N-E-L. People, if you don't know this name, you are going to know this name. This guy put on one of the best shows I've ever seen. Young person or? Yeah, he's young. I mean, I don't know exactly how old he is. Maybe he's my age, so I'll call that young. Yeah. (laughs) Just the older I get, the younger I think my current age is. But we went to Hollywood Suits. We had literally, I want to say 90 minutes. And we walked in. We didn't even have 90 minutes. We had an hour. We walked in. We just said, here are our sizes. Wear your suits. Went over, grabbed whatever looked reasonably good off the rack. I hate that. Were they did the itchy because I hate. The well, hold on. So we get stuff. then it's like, what size is your neck shirt? Boom! The guy like throws it on top because it's sort of a rack and stack high volume spot, right? And then it's like shoes, belt, this, that, and the other thing. And we walked out the door with everything for between one hundred and fifty and two hundred dollars a suit. That's okay. insane. It's That's insane. awesome. Yeah. So then they can't do the. We can't, they can't do the hemming there. So you have to go, like, go down this alley around the corner and you think you might be murdered, but no, you find somebody who's in this you little can staple room. It, though. I've done that before. You could staple it. We didn't have staplers. Okay. So, you know, we're, we're, we have to like call an Uber in, in 30 minutes to get to this place. And we get everything done. Literally, we walk in the door and then 45 minutes later, we're in our suits. And we go to the Magic Castle and my friend and I both have... I don't have a lot of suits, right? But I have one or two nice suits for weddings and things like that. They're not cheap. And they're fitted in this, that, and the other thing. And both of us looked at the suits and thought, okay, these are not the best suits in the world, but they are surprisingly fitting and surprisingly good. And we, I got a compliment on my suit while I was there. And it raises questions, Yeah, right? When it's like, okay, this was $150, $200, so what, it, what differentiates? And yes, there are better materials. Yes, there's better fitting. But then you're waiting like five months for alterations or whatever when you get into the super fancy class. And you're like, okay, that's not about entirely quality. That's about the story of the wait. That's right. about being able to tell your friends the process you went through to get the thing. Right. Which is not to diminish its value. It's just to say it's really interesting that so much, such a high percentage of the total cost could be placed on that. So I think about these things. Do you think you're going to get into any other high-end stuff? Although I want to back up to your comment that to get the equivalent in terms of grade for wine yeah. would just be impossibly cost prohibitive, right? It's, you're, gonna, you're just going to have to pay out the nose and take out a second mortgage. So affordable luxuries, right? In terms of affordable luxuries, anything else that you enjoy that you would sort of put in the same class? For me, one would be chocolate. Mm. you can get what some, the some would consider yeah. the best chocolate in the world. And if you're willing to spend even 20 bucks, 30 What's your bucks, go-to? 50. I like Dick Taylor. I used to be, all right, I want to hear yours. I haven't been in this world for a long time, but about 10 years ago, I really got into it. This is, this is when I was actually, I guess, a little bit earlier, maybe 11, 12 years when I was working on The 4-Hour Chef. Yeah. I got into this and looked at it very seriously. I, coffee, you can really get incredible mm. coffee if you're willing to pay up just a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. The, the coffee is one that I, I do pay up for. I order a subscription, which is their single origin high-end coffee from a roaster called Proud Mary. Mm-hmm. And they're based in Australia, but they have a location in Portland, Oregon as well. Mm-hmm. And so they have a varietal of coffee called a Geisha coffee. Have you Geisha? Ever, yeah, have you ever had it before? No. So it is just like the most delicate, awesome, floral, beautiful, elegant coffee you can consume. Whereas when you make it properly, 
And I do, I do the whole measuring myself, you know, 32 grams of coffee, 350 grams of water, and I do it via pour over. And when you do it, you don't need to add anything. So no, no sugar, no, but no, uh, no butter. No butter. <laughs> I was thinking of the old, the old days. <laughs> no of doing pork the, chops. <laughs> no, was, remember when we did? You remember yeah, the bulletproof coffee, coffee bulletproof and coffees? so on. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So um, <laughs> until I started no getting butter. my cardiac markers that, measured regularly. Oh my god, dude! I used to do bulletproof coffees all the time, where I'd add MCT oil mm-hmm. and butter, and then just I, you basically drink that coffee, and about a half hour later, disaster. Pants. You just shit your brains <laughs> out. <laughs> It's just like the worst. Why did we ever do that? Then I got my numbers yeah. back from Atia, and it's like freaking yeah. my cholesterol's all jacked That's up like, all over you, the place. Do yeah. you have an IV bag full of triglycerides? Yeah, like, exactly. hey, what's happening here? So yeah, I would say you, you've nailed that. I think chocolate. You know, coffee is another one. Coffee is something I, you know, I do a cup every day. So that's great. Teas in the same camp. You can get really nice high end teas that are amazing for you know under fifty dollars. You know, this is going to be maybe funny coming right after talking about health stuff and metrics. But I think when I get quite a bit older, maybe if I'm like, okay, I'm on the tail end here. I think I might take up pipe smoking. No, my I, dad used to smoke. a pipe. I love just the, it looks so relaxing. But not inhaling? And the smell of pipe tobacco yes. is so incredible. Oh, dude. I think I just want to be like a cantankerous old guy. It's, in a rocking chair on a porch, smoking my pipe, reading so, my book. I used to go in. Of course, I didn't. I don't know. I, don't, I mean, maybe I wouldn't inhale. I guess you're supposed to just bring it to your mouth and then like puff away at it. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't smoke pipes. I think most people would inhale, but like they used to have these old tobacco shops you could go into where they sell raw tobacco. Uh-huh. And I used to go in with my dad, and that's a good childhood memory because the smell is so amazing. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah it's really, really, really phenomenal. So, what else would fit that? And actually, people should also. Just ping us on Twitter and let us know if, if we're missing a category because I enjoy thinking about affordable luxuries that most people could bring into their lives so they can carve out a small, a small piece of time, a small amount of cash to really feel like they're treating themselves to something that is amazing, right? And there are just certain categories where that's not possible because of how much demand there is and therefore how high the prices can escalate. There's a bunch of stuff. I mean, for me, there's little tiny micro upgrades that you do around your household when you think about this stuff. And there's, so I was, I lived near a a convenience store and I had run out of, of body soap. Right. Mm -hmm. And I went across the street and I bought some dove like body soap. and It was like cedar or something. I'm like, Oh, that sounds okay. Whatever. And I got there, by the time I got home, I flipped over the back of the label and it was a bunch of artificial stuff in there. Like yeah. it wasn't all as pure as the outside had said it, it was on the front. <laughs> and I put it on and it was like a perfume bomb. It was like so nasty. <laughs> and I was like, why did I do this? And you go out and yes, you spend $25, $30 more and you get something from Aesop or a similar brand. And it's just amazing. And you just yeah. like, it, speaking of those little luxuries, and I know that's like, probably up on the lamer side of luxuries, <laughs> but I don't know. I like little things like that, like little tiny micro upgrades around the house, you know? Yeah. I have, I have a very simple rule when it comes to soap and shampoo. Well, and you're conditioning. in the dating life though. You need to have oh, upgraded boy. shit. Well, let me pause. I'll come, we can come back to that if we want to. <laughs> I know you want to. We'll see, we'll see, we'll see where it goes. <laughs> but I actually get complimented on my skin a lot. Like people are like, what do you use for this and this and that? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it's, no, it it's luscious. It's great. It's yeah. luscious. It's very supple, supple, <laughs> moist. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, and all I use, I have for years only used Dr. Bronner's baby soap, basically unscented baby soap. Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from your wife. That stuff is so simple. I never feel like I have dry skin. I'm bald, so it makes it easy, right? It's kind of one one tool for all things. And there you have it. It's not actually a luxury, but I'm just no, saying. No, it's great. <laughs> no, I use that too, actually. It's, it's, it's great stuff. And you can buy them in like gigantic sizes. So they last a long time. Yeah. So that's my, my comment on personal hygiene and soap. So dating life. <laughs> no, we don't have to get into that. <laughs> Well, what do you, let's see. Let me, well, what are your questions? I, can, no, I was just curious. Like, you know, we haven't talked about this in great detail, but I'm curious. Like, how do you do? You change your house? Like, talking about the upgrades. Like, you have to like 
create a cozy change my house well <laughs> first of all i'm you know i'm paranoid and crazy about safety and security yeah. stuff so generally i mean first meetings are always out somewhere public and for anyone who is currently in the fray of dating apps they know that it is by and large just terrible it's so bad <laughs> and I, yeah I've, I've found it interesting what i would say is like if you're in a relationship and you're like wow this is hard this is this this is that and you know it would just be so much easier if i were single and i'd be having all the fun in the world and it's like you're just trading a different set of problems you're yeah. just so now that's not to complain about it, but I don't think this subject's going to go anywhere. We can cut this. Part. No, we don't. We don't. We don't have to. I'm just curious. But have you changed anything in terms of like your workout regimens or anything like that to get back into fighting shape? <laughs> I, well, yes. I mean, I have been training. I mean, my my training is pretty consistent. I would say that one of the bigger challenges about dating is that I do not recover. Actually, this ties into something. I don't recover from alcohol nearly as well as I used to. Yeah. And the fact of the matter is, generally, if you're going out, people are going to want to have a drink, or it's just going to be social to have a drink yeah. or two. Nothing crazy. I have no interest in that. But even two glasses of wine I can completely obliterate my sleep. And so the jury is out on what I'm going to bring up, but there is... This product, which I think you have tried. Now, yes. I, have, I have not tried it. This was, this was introduced to me by a friend who swears by it and said he was about to stop drinking, which may, might have been a good thing, but he didn't because he started using this product called Z-Biotics. And Z-Biotics is pre-alcohol probiotic drink. And there are these... I keep... <laughs> Hiccuping like the stork from <laughs> the Saturday morning cartoons after my like five sips of beer. Of Jesus. Beer. All right. So 12 bottles of this. And the, the basic selling point is that you are consuming a prebiotic. And I'm going to bring up the exact prebiotic because I would love to get some scientific input from people who can assess this or who have tried it. Here is the, the, the selling point in the pamphlet. So the world's first genetically engineered probiotic I mean, first, world's first is always a strong, a strong statement. So I'd be curious to, to hear if, if anybody can verify. But built by PhD microbiologist, Zbiotics is the only product that actively breaks down acetaldehyde. Nope. I added an A. I knew I was going to do it, Daria. Acetaldehyde. I'm just saying it really quickly. Acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde. I'm check one of these while we're talking. In any case, <laughs> means when you drink booze, it is intended to help you metabolize or neutralize at least some of the things that will cause you to feel terrible. So this is back to the pamphlet. We started with a natural probiotic, which humans have been eating for centuries. Then we altered its DNA to produce an enzyme that breaks down the aforementioned word that I shall not repeat. This enzyme is just like the one your liver uses, but our prebiotic is designed to deliver it to your gut, a place where your liver can access and where you need it most. So that last paragraph is where I'd love to have people help me understand if there's any credible science to back this up. I went on PubMed. I looked at some of the studies related to the actual strain of probiotic, which is either Bacillus sutilis or subtilis, and that is spelled B-A-C-I-L-L-U-S space S-U-B-T-I-L-L-I-S Z-B-183. The reason I mentioned that is when I looked it up, the study seemed to show that it could mitigate some liver damage with excessive alcohol consumption and so on. But I didn't see much on the gut. Most of the studies seem to be in different strains of animals and insects, like silkworms of all things, I think were included. So who knows how that transfers. So would love to know what people think. What does your buddy say? Is it like preventing hangovers? He said that this has completely changed his life from the but perspective. But changed it in what way? Like, is he waking up just he wakes up without the type of hangover and costs that have come with drinking prior. Now it's like credit cards. He yes. <laughs> doesn't charge as much. And so other people might bring up something like activated charcoal. I would be curious to hear if you found anything helpful. You, you have more mileage than I do with drinking booze. <laughs> <laughs> I love this episode. You're like, Hey, you like fancy rich shit. Like tell me some of the, some of the stuff that we, commoners can use. When we first get started, dude, you, you, you do more rich shit than I do. So. Oh, what? Oh, don't oh, you're going to cut, oh, yeah, no, cut that. Don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> You'd lose that one. 
<laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, you like to drink a lot. Tell me more, Kevin. <laughs> you alcoholic. <laughs> You have a broader spectrum of expertise when, oh, thank it, you. when it comes to... <laughs> oh, well, now that you put it that way. <laughs> yeah, when it comes to training yes. in, the, in the dark arts of dark alcohol arts. consumption. <laughs> so, Tim, thank you for mentioning that. <laughs> I did get my PhD. <laughs> now, I would say that I did try this at a, at a party about four or five months ago, and I think, you know, you had made a joke <laughs> before the show started where, like, if you're, like, is something about car accidents and a helmet and like it, it's like if you're going to drive fast enough oh, no what i said was yeah, there's like there's a point at which it doesn't really help right? Right. Exactly. <laughs> like, when you're like band-aids are great if you cut your finger like you want band-aids right but if you just like chop, chop your off finger your off arm. <laughs> right. yeah, like, yeah so that that's been my problem is i've I, every time i've tried one of these i've chopped my arm off like <laughs> i was at a party where where it was like everyone was passing them out and i'm like oh like the hangover cure. Like I'm in. And then I have like five drinks, you know, <laughs> yeah, and it was, right. it was our, our big annual NFT party, not this year, but last year. And it ended up being a lot of drinks. And so I woke up a little hungover. So anyway, <laughs> didn't work for me. Crappy <laughs> <Okay>. product. No, <laughs> it could be great. Daria, have, have you, you've tried it. Have you had any success? No, no. no success there. All right. So I'd be curious to hear what people think. And this is really broadly to lob a question into the audience, which is what have you found helpful for hangovers? And you can just hit us on Twitter with, yeah. with hashtag hangover. No, what's interesting. <laughs> and I'm sure there are going to be a bunch of sanctimonious people who are like, I don't drink. That's what I do. But yeah, hashtag old liver. You guys can not reply because we don't, we don't need those. I've cut back a lot on booze, but occasionally there's a place for it. And by the way, all you folks who are like, I'm enlightened. I don't drink anymore. I just use ketamine five times a week. You guys are going to have a rude awakening in, in a handful of years. Did you hear that they've, they're finding fentanyl mixed in with ketamine now? Of course they are. Yeah, fentanyl is mixed in with everything. And by the way, folks, two milligrams overdose, you're dead. Yeah. If you get stuff mixed in. It's serious. So Don't mess around. Yet with another stuff, reason not to play around with miscellaneous powders. Yeah. What's um, up next, Dr. Kevin? All right. So I want to talk a little bit about my obsession with AI. Yeah, let's do it. Because it's changed a lot. So let me just put it to you this way. You know how I always track new shit. Like I, yes. I pride myself in always being someone to want to play with whatever is kind of halfway working slash breaking. If it means that, you know, five years from now, I was able to spot something early on yeah. and, 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 you know, hopefully identify a trend before it really took off. So mm -hmm. I would say that GPT, when it came out, the chat GPT, the first few ver versions were just were just fun for me. It was kind of like, uh, oh, I'm having a conversation with AI. Wow, it's just, it's it's actually producing a real result when I'm like typing to it. it. It can help me rephrase or rewrite a paragraph, or you know, it can summarize some bullet points. Like there's, it was doing a lot of little small meaningless, more or less tasks, but quite well. And then 4.0 came out. Yeah. So when 4.0 came out, my consumption of and usage of chat GPT went from about, you know, let's call it 30 minutes a week to probably about five hours a week now. No kidding. So I use it a lot. What are you using it for now? I'm using it to code. Mm. So it can, it can code for me now. So, mm -hmm. you know, my background here, like I studied computer science, but I dropped out. And part of the reason I, I don't know how much I've mentioned this publicly, but part of the reason I dropped out was that I could look and understand code a lot faster than I could write it. Yeah. And so, you know, it's still to this day, I can, I can read code just fine. I mean, this, granted, sometimes there's some syntax I would have to look up or figure out, but like more or less I'm there. The issue was that if I'm thinking through a problem, it would take me, you know, three to four times as long as anyone else to like figure out the same problem. Mm -hmm. And it just, I just didn't have the brain for it. Yeah. With GPT, I can come in and as I start to have little hiccups or I want to think through a problem, I can just ask it to figure it out for me. And it writes code that is like 99% like ready to go. Could you give an example of yeah, a problem? I'll give an example. Let's say you are your WordPress user, right? That's what your blog's powered yep. on. And you're like, mm, I want to write a new WordPress plugin. And I want it to do this with my audience, segment it like this, do this only when someone is coming from this country and make it appear like this. And you know, you could change anything you want. You just describe it in a couple of paragraphs and say, go, it literally will print out all the code for you. You copy and paste it and save it as a script and you're good to go. And it works. <laughs> it's insane. 
So what does that mean for, say, five years from now? Well, a couple things. Practically speaking, right now, my engineering team, I had one of my developers tell me, hey, I had this, like, what they would call a, a kind of laborious kind of task of, like, just something you don't want to code. You're like, ah, God, I got to resort this data in a certain way. And like, yeah, this is going to take me 45 minutes. It was done in five, right? Mm -hmm. And it's like- Using ChatGPT. Yes. And so like all of those little meaningless coding tasks, they're just gone, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, it's already, it's done. It's done. Yeah. And so I've been using it to create art and I can tell it to go and write P5JS scripts for me, which is what Artblocks is based on for all the NFTs. So art meaning you're using code- to yes. generate generative art. art. Exactly. <laughs> and so I can describe it visually and it comes back with something that's amazing. That's and cool. I'll show you some examples yeah, after the I'd podcast. Love, I'd love to see it. And it's crazy addicting because you start getting into it and you're like, oh, what if you take it in this direction, in this direction? So you're only limited, you're limited no longer by your skill, but your own internal creativity of your, of your brain. And your ability to prompt well. Yes, yes. But you can even help it right I'll give you an example. This is about to get super meta. No, yeah, exactly. You can tell it, I'm having a hard time writing a prompt. How might I be more efficient? And it'll give you 10 ways to rewrite the prompt. So, you, and it, so it just, it's, it's helping itself. It's yeah. so nuts. Yeah. And so once you realize that it's so much more than just rewriting a paragraph where you are helping put together an essay, but it can actually create real software for you, dude, it's, it's just, I realize now that what's going to happen is that, you know, Mark Andreessen was very famous, very famous venture capitalist, maybe a decade ago of saying software is eating the world, yep. right? And so it was this idea that we had all of these old systems that were largely, you know, pen and paper based or weren't connected or weren't efficient. And software would come in and be connected, be put, the data we put in the cloud and we would have, you know, this new type of, of in-cloud infrastructure, right? That mm-hmm. would power everything and be connected like it never was before. All of that is, is, is still continuing to happen. But this next generation is what I believe is AI is going to eat the software. So if, if, if software ate the world, AI is going to eat the software, meaning that AI is going to come in and reimagine every single tool that we use. So every single productivity tool that we use it will be a part of almost every application that we use in, in really meaningful ways. Like I've seen it, it sort data and create, you know, so I, I don't know about you, but when I use Excel, the hardest thing for me to always wrap my head around and figure out were pivot tables. Do you ever get good at pivot tables? No, I never oh, got good at, at Excel period. Oh my God. Pivot tables were one of those <laughs> things where it was just like, it was, a, it was a, they're, they're a nightmare to, I to, use to, notebooks to, and then I lose my notebooks and okay. I'm screwed. So anyway, <laughs> You don't have to learn it any longer. You just tell it what you want, how you want the data slice and dice. And it just like, it not, not when I would, what I don't mean is the output from chat GPT, but I mean, it will be working in Excel or in Google sheets yeah. and just automatically rewrite the tables for you. That's wild. And so it's, you're just going to give it a little prompt and that's right. it. And I'm telling you this, this is coming a lot faster than I had thought. So two years ago, it was very linear to me. I was like, mm. oh, month over month, like, oh yeah, G- chat GPT three is out now, now three point five, and I see a little bit of an upgrade. When four hit, oh my god, like it seems everything like it's just has gone changed. Vertical. It's gone vertical. Yeah. It's exponential now. And so, dude, the next couple years are going to be insane, just insane. Yeah, I think the next twelve months are going to be. Yeah, you're probably right. Full cuckoo. I'm, I'm being full, conservative. Yeah, yeah, full cuckoo bananas. I mean, I've been. Not to the extent that you have probably, but experimenting here and there, having my team experiment also to see if people who are non-technical, I'm non-technical, but I can figure out quite a few things. People who really have maybe even an allergy to a lot of tech tools, like what they can do with ChatGPT, just to try to peek around that corner. Like, okay, what is this going to look like when there's more mass adoption? And I ran an art competition which was an AI art competition a while back and was absolutely This blown. is for the, the punch of cock. This is for the punch of cock. The the, the punch de cock. <laughs> as they say. Yes. As they say in France. Translated in so many yeah. languages now. Oh yeah, no, it's it's a massive global phenomenon. How do you say that in Japanese, by the way? Koku <laughs> punch. Uh, uh. <laughs> Yeah. So the uh, 
Yes, that was for the Cock Punch NFT, which raised two million bucks, something like that, maybe one point seven to two million bucks for the foundation, which is great. All that's been deployed, and that's all fantastic for scientific research. But the the point I was going to make, the art competition following that, where fan art was being generated using AI, people could also use Photoshop and other tools to fine tune or to manipulate anything that came out of, say, Mid Journey or Dolly or something like that. The results absolutely blew my mind. And I'm going to be, you, you heard it here first, folks, so I'm going to be running some more competitions, which will have different formats, because a prerequisite or a condition of valid submission for the competition was you had to capture your entire process well enough that somebody could stand a good chance of replicating your result. Mm. And by capturing that, now we have, let's just say, top 10 finalists. You have 10 extremely good tutorials for people who want to step into the yeah. ring and play with it themselves. So you've heard of Stable Diffusion, right? I have, yeah. Okay, so Stable Diffusion is one like Mid Journey. Mm -hmm. It's one like, you know, any of these like Dolly that can create imagery out yep. of prompts, right? They, so... Stable Diffusion went open source. Yep. Which was a big, like, oh, fuck. Maverick move. Yeah. It, yeah it was, but it was like, oh, shit. Cause like they release it, once you release it open source, yeah, it's everybody's gone. got it and they're running with it in different directions. Right. Yeah. So a buddy of mine gave me a Discord to okay. go into and he's like, you got to check this shit out. This is crazy. Right. And it's called Unstable Diffusion. Okay. And so they basically took all the guardrails off of Stable Diffusion. Yeah. <laughs> you know, all the protections and yeah. shit. Oh my God. What kind the of stuff thing, do you see? Dude, what do you think you see? I don't know. Deep, I, deep fake Taylor Swift porn. Uh, imagine I mean, anything. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> anything you can imagine in its ultra realistic like state where you're, you're almost like you look at it and you're like, is that an image? Like it's, it's like, you don't even know, like it's tricked you already, but it's like the most elegant <laughs> it's like it's just, just like, say it no it's just like it's it's like <laughs> porn done in its like finest very, like very tasteful ai porn no 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 but like you can do whatever you want yeah so like there's all these different channels and so you can go into some channels and see like aliens with like six breasts and like weird shit like where you're like that looks real not like yeah, yeah, yeah. like what was it the movie of terminator arnold schwarzenegger was in with the three-breasted woman you know what i'm talking about Total recall. Total recall. Yeah, not that. Like this looks a real, like it's it, it's it's disturbingly real stuff, yeah, yeah. right? Teenage boys are screwed. They're it, not they're gonna screwed. they're not gonna they're get screwed. anything done in the next dude. This is <laughs> ten years. Well, no, but they're screwed in terms of relationships, dude. Yeah, I'm telling you, this is what worries me. So, remember the movie Her, right? Yeah, I do. So great movie. One of the things about Her, well, for people that haven't watched it, you got to go and watch this because it's going to going to become a reality. This man that has a relationship with his phone. And the phone has a very serious, like, you know, AI on it. Yeah, phone or laptop when he's at work. There's, right, exactly. There's this ubiquitous AI companion. Just following him around, right? Mm -hmm. And one of the things about OpenAI that you can do now is you can save and train model data to be persistent. Mm -hmm. So I can go in right now. Sorry for toaster licking the bowl in the background. <laughs> the, 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 ringing the Tibetan yeah. meditation yeah, bowl exactly. with this, <laughs> this <laughs> collar. collar. <laughs> All right. So what you can do is you can go in and you can say, here are the properties of who I want you to be. And people are doing this. There's this website that has all these AI hacks, prompt hacks, they call it. Mm -hmm. And you can go in and say, you are this personality type. You're a little bit bitchy. You're sassy, like blah, blah. And you can save this. And it will respond to you and learn from you. And you can have what appears to be a human conversation with your perfect, like polar opposite or whatever you're looking yeah, for yeah. in life. Dude, I'm telling you, we're three years out from that being conversation have, based. Have you heard of Replica with a K? Yes, of course. I looked okay. at that. I almost invested in that company years All ago. Right. All right. So you should explain Replica because they claim to have 10 million registered users. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a company that was raising capital quite a while ago. And I, I saw them, but it was before the AI thing really took off yeah. but yeah i mean this is this is it like this is this idea and i worry because like you know you think of countries Replica is her just so you guys know i mean there's more to it but yeah that's basically it but imagine imagine you've we, seen this you would know this better than i would but in japan there's been this the decrease in in dating and i've, I've heard about there's like the shame of like whether or not you have a, a high quality job enough and like there's like this disconnect between the male and female population you know what I'm talking about? 
there was a report that came out on the, how dating was in the decline. Well, dating and fertility, and fertility, just, yes, uh, reproduction in general is is on the decline, and they're they're in a very problematic situation. So imagine from birth rate, like replacement rates, they're in a really sticky, terrible situation. Okay, so now Which I uh, think China could be in in like twenty, thirty years, twenty, uh, twenty years probably. But I think we're all going to be there because like I think, population implosion. I think you might just have a partner online, like a, a AI. Yeah. Like we might just have AI yeah. partners, you know? Well, I was talking to, I was talking to someone about this because as you mentioned, right, I'm, I'm single now and they said, Oh, you should hop on replica. Just like check it out. And I was like, I don't actually want to scare you. It, well, it scared me in the sense that I was like, okay, there are times when I'm really lonely. Yeah. And humans are messy. Humans are difficult. And if you get close to someone, it's great for a while. You have the honeymoon phase and things are great and puppy love and like, <laughs> everything you do is so funny. And then things change, right? And it gets a little more complex. But if you had an AI companion who, especially if it were compelling voice, oh, which yeah. is going to happen oh, immediately. Two, I mean, two it's, years. it's already like I've seen, I've seen AI, I can't remember the company names, but that have been trained on voice data. Yes. To mimic. And I actually know podcasts that are being produced right now. This show. Use, using AI. <laughs> <laughs> We're not even here. AI to read scripts that are sort of pieced together from celebrity sample data. Yes. And listeners have no idea. Yeah. They have no idea. It's like these, so these crazy. podcasts are not quote unquote real because it's not what you think it is. And we are so close to there being the equivalent of like the Scarlett Johansson, her, right? Yeah. Like sexy, smoky voice, yeah. like sassy, funny, getting there. Gives you a little shit from time to time, but doesn't yeah. ask you to pick up your socks. Yeah, right. <laughs> right, that kind no, of thing. Darn, is looking at and, me. I'm, yeah. sorry, I'm, just, I'm kidding. The, I didn't want to dig into Replica because I was like, you know, there's a chance yeah, you that it's better than I think it's going to be. Yes. And then I start playing the game because I'm like, oh, I'm just testing the service. And then I start getting my human needs met by this AI, Dude, and this it takes and it and it takes the pressure off of which maybe sometimes could be a good thing, but takes the pressure off of human interaction. Dude, I think this this is my point. This is why I wanted to bring this up. I think this is going to happen. The question is, if I children of men, here we actually, come. I have a question for Daria. Like, if I start talking to someone on AI that is a, a female AI person, is that cheating? It is. Yes. What? That, that doesn't no no well I'm just repeating what she said that doesn't that doesn't surprise me I've thought about this a lot too I'm is like cheating if I talk to AI and well I mean especially if it's like sexting and this that, and the other thing why is that cheating <laughs> it's an AI what, what did she say she said well you don't talk to me <laughs> <laughs> well stop bitching about my socks <laughs> <laughs> yeah the, the, I think that this will become an absolute issue right. Oh, it's going to be a huge issue. It's going to be a huge issue. This is one of the things that it really, truly keeps me up being like, I either need to invest in this company or avoid it or a combination of thereof. Yeah, like, and, and invest in it so that you can have your bug out bag and your, your bunker. Yeah. And your, <laughs> it's just <laughs> everything prepared for the apocalypse. Okay. Speaking of the apocalypse, do you, do you mind if we switch to... Yeah, let's do it. Let's do it. That bo was a fun bo one. Bo bo Bology bet. That was a fun one. I'm glad you brought that up. So I, <laughs> I'm a spectator mostly at this point. Maybe I'll, I'll just serve as a stand-in for the audience, for those who are not deeply intimate with crypto or this world. But what, what bet, so Balaji Srinivasan, yes. what bet did he make, roughly? We don't have to get all the dates right or anything like that. And what do you think of it? Yeah, so basically, for people that don't know, this is an individual, Balaji is like really well-known. Former CTO of Coinbase. Yes, and also just insanely well-known for nailing a lot of the COVID predictions. Yeah. Like he came out and said, you know, things like really intimate details, like, you know, masks will be a fashion statement, like really early on. Mm -hmm. Right. Like this is like where if you read this stuff and we all have historically going back, you'd be like, wow, that, that, that Bravo, like really prescient stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when he talks about the future, a lot of people pay attention. Yep. And so one of the things that happened with the, the collapse of, the, of a lot of regional banks with SVB and then First Republic and others is he said, you know, this is, this is not an isolated event. 
There's going to be a triggering that's going to lead to hyperinflation, the devaluing of the dollar. And in the next 90 days, Bitcoin is going to be worth $1 million a coin. And I'm willing to stake and bet a million dollars that that is the case. So somebody else had challenged I think that. he responded to someone who said, I'll okay. put a million dollars on the line. He's like, I'll take that bet. Okay. There and you go. Someone, I think June 17th or something. Yes. 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 They, so you're more accurate than I am. But that, that was essentially it. So that led me to pay attention. I was like, okay, yeah. well- let That's a lot of people to pay attention. Right. Let, let, let's, let's, let's dive into this and figure out what's going on with Bitcoin. And honestly, what it, it, it caused me to do personally is I hadn't paid attention to Bitcoin in a long time. Yeah. I've been in the world of Ethereum with NFTs and everything else. And there, there's something like nice about how scalable and green Ethereum is that now that's moved to proof of stake. And there's just a lot more activity there day to day than there is, say, Bitcoin. Right. Mm -hmm. But I started digging into Bitcoin. And one of the things I realized is that in a world where the press cycles are always coming back to, or oftentimes they're hitting Ethereum pretty hard in that their NFTs go up, they go down, they go left, they go right. That's like a bad look for Ethereum. In yep. some cases, people get hacked. It's a bad look, like lose a certain amount of money. I know, people. <laughs> yeah, I know that quite well. But I'm just saying that there's these certain black eyes and there's something about the simplicity of Bitcoin and the store of value that is still attractive because right. it is, it's the OG cryptocurrency. It's still trading at over $30,000 as, as of the time of this podcast. And every year that goes on, it seems to be, you know, a more legitimate asset. Recording that, on April 16th. Yeah. But, but every year that goes on, it seems to me a more legitimate asset that is going to stand the test of time. It's not going to zero, right? Like yeah. it's a digital currency. It was the first of its kind. So, you know, I started playing around with some of the layer two that's built on, stop, uh, on top of that with the Lightning Network and noticed that some of the pain points have been smoothed down a little bit. And then I realized one thing that, that caught me where I was like, you know what? Can you explain to people who don't know what that is? What yeah, that so, is? so Bitcoin is notorious for being just a very low transaction per second blockchain. So if you threw, like, say you know, the visa scale at it, like how many times a visa card gets swiped every day. It, it wouldn't even, it, it would just, it's laughable. It's like they can do, you know, singular low double digit transactions per second, whereas visa can do, you know, 40,000 plus or whatever it may be. I'm just, right. these are rough estimates, but you get what I'm saying. It's, it's along those orders of magnitude. So Bitcoin had to figure out a solution that would scale, help it scale that infrastructure so that more payments could happen. Yep. And so they created a layer two that kind of sits on top of it that still has final, it resolves back to the main coin. So it has the security and safety of Bitcoin. It's much how Ethereum is scaling right now with mm -hmm. some of the layer two networks that sit on top of it. So their main one is called Lightning. It's the Lightning Network. And so it allows you to do ultra fast transactions and it, it can scale up to, they say, I think it's up to a million transactions a second or something. It's something crazy. They haven't tested it at those limits, but that's what the paper is written as anyway. So I tried a bunch of this stuff out. I kicked the tires on a few things. And then I realized that Bitcoin, unlike Ethereum, the nice thing about it, it has this you know, finite supply mm -hmm. that is slowly coming to an end like over time, right? So every, I think it's four, four and a half years, they do a halfening event where they decrease the total number of issued coins in half. They do this chop, they chop it right in half as in terms of the number of coins, new coins issued and they're about to do another cycle here in a little over a year. So when this next happening event happens, there's even less currency coming out of that faucet. Mm -hmm. So, you know, these happening events, I went back and looked historically, and they're typically the year before the happening event and the year after the happening event, you typically see a pretty How many happenings have there been? Quite a few. I mean, so I, it's, like, it's like five now or something like okay. that. So you typically see, and I, don't get me wrong, like I'm not saying this is not investment advice. This is not always going to hold true. But obviously, if there's more demand and less supply, meaning less Bitcoins being issued, you're going to see a change in price. That's just, mm -hmm. you know, obviously we know these markets out and how they play out. So no one's talking about the happening yet. It typically, people start raising chatter around this time. Mm -hmm. And so when every single other time when I, when a happening events start to happen and the chatter starts to spin up, the price has always gone up. And I've yeah. watched this happen time and time again. So for me, I was like, you know what? Classic cryptocurrency. I hate that it's not green. 
that kills me. I'm happy that more mining services are going green and they're moving to cheaper energy sources, which are typically by like thermodynamic and a bunch of the nuclear energy and a, but they try yeah, to wind. Move. They're There's exactly a ton in Texas. Yeah. So they're trying to move closer to these energy sources so they can get cheaper power. That said, I still think there's obviously a lot of, of dirty energy that's being wasted here on Bitcoin mining. It's a big bummer, but you know, that is the one part that just gives me a little bit of pause that like kind of hurts my soul. But I, I did, you know, purchase a little position there because I do like it, especially in times where we see the devaluing of the dollar. We see Russia and China buying more gold. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I want a nice hedge that's decoupled from the dollar that's sitting out there that, you know, I'm not saying it should be a big double digit percentage of your overall, you know, asset allocation. But for me personally, I, I don't mind having a little of that parked in and set on the side. So maybe you could repeat for the audience what you said to me, this is a while back, but when we were talking about this and we were talking about what might happen if the dollar is just massively devalued or if we experience hyper, hyper, hyper inflation, right? yeah. we're like carting around dollar bills and uh, wheelbarrows to buy, you know, a Kit Kat at the local 7-Eleven. Well, you and I were talking about this and we were like, <laughs> oh, this is crazy bet happened. This was probably like, what, a, maybe a month ago or something. Yeah. And we're like, this crazy bet happened. It's a million dollars. And if Bitcoin goes to a million and I was like, well, wait a second. Like if Bitcoin goes to a million dollars and there's hyperinflation, then a million dollars is worth like, and you said, yeah, like the price of a sandwich or something like that. <laughs> yeah. And I was like, yeah, so it doesn't really matter. Like Bitcoin's a hard one because when you traditionally think about currencies, you always think them pegged to somebody else's GDP, right? So yeah. you think of the, the pound being pegged to, you know, what's going on in, in the UK. And it's like, what do you peg Bitcoin to? Yeah. Well, also, like, there's the question of, like, what is its value in the absence of a reliable peg? Right, exactly. And, that's and, a, that's and a better if, question, yes. I mean, this is, to, to be clear, I'm sure the maxis are going to just have a field day with this one, but there are some people I, I respect and admire among that crowd, but there are also a lot of very aggressive sort of religious fundamentalists in there, which, I, which I'd prefer not to spend so much time with. But the, the there are a bunch of questions that I have, which I don't have great answers to, but they're just questions. One would be what you just described, right? It's like, okay, well, if the dollar experiences this massive hyperinflation, what does how does one establish the value of Bitcoin for the exchange of services or goods? Right. Right. The second, I think, is for me, what happens in a place like Europe? What happens in a place like Japan? What happens in a place like fill in the blank if the U.S. collapses? <laughs> right. right. So where is the sort of currency safe haven Right. if there is one? Well, and, and then the next question is, if, if things were to get that bad, and it doesn't even need to be, if we assume for the moment that the rise in Bitcoin price to, let's just say, Bology's bet of a million is predicated on a, on a similar increase in hyperinflation for the dollar, right. Right, which would just not be sustainable, right? The whole country just blows to pieces. Do you not have more pressing problems than Bitcoin? Right. Like, are you going to be able to get on your... United flight to escape the U.S. to fill in the blank location. You, you're going to have such a series of questions that are more fundamental, perhaps, than money. That if you think that is a likely outcome, you should be in full blown advanced prepper mode right now. Right. Well, the the question I, I guess I, I think I have is like, are the rails in place? for the preppers to get into Bitcoin. Because if something happens where we see this massive- Or the, or the Bitcoiners to get into prepping properly. But yeah, yeah. But, but let's, let's, we can deal with the first. Yeah, so the first one I, I would say is like, you know, in, this is two of us playing economists on TV, <laughs> on, on podcasts, which <laughs> is not- With some booze. <laughs> with some booze, which is never sound advice. But Yeah, yeah this is but, not but, economic but, advice. But, if any central bankers are listening. Right, yeah, exactly, please come on, join us. <laughs> So the, the one thing that I, I think is, is interesting is when you think about what is happening worldwide right now with, with China and with Russia, and we take a look at the 
data, what does the data tell us over the last few months? And what has been reported is that China and Russia right now are not buying Bitcoin, but they're buying a lot of gold. Mm -hmm. And so that to me doesn't signal as though we have an emergent new world currency as much as it does instability and a flight to safety. And so if there's instability in a flight to safety and gold is still, you know, the, the kind of safe haven for that, which it appears mm -hmm. to be, that would explain why, I mean, there's been, since November, there's been a 40% run up on the price of gold. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know that Bitcoin is that safe haven, but there's one chart, there's one graphic that blew my mind and it made me rethink everything. And that is when the day that SVB came out and said, we're potentially insolvent and all the regional banks took a hit. Yep. There was a screenshot. Did you see the screenshot? Do you know what I'm, I'm about to talk sure. about? There was a screenshot where someone saved to their iPhone, all the regional banks, all the major banks even as well. And it was a list of all of them in the stocks app, right? You know how you can list them yeah, and yeah, it, like, yeah. it just goes down the screen. It's like negative 20%, negative 15%, negative 30%, like just going oh, down the yeah, screen. Yeah. It was F just like, FRB was like negative 60 oh, or dude, something. It was just bloody all the way down. And then there was two at the top. It was Bitcoin and Ethereum and they were both green, like heavy green. And that was the first time where I was like, oh shit. Because every single time there has always been at least and this is someone's observational data. Like I'm just like, what, what, from what I can recall, the market has been more or less tightly coupled with Bitcoin and Ethereum. Like the super market's down, tight, super tightly coupled. If the market's down, they're down, right? Because it's it's a speculative asset, and when people start to feel their pocketbooks hurting, yeah. they pull out of cryptocurrency. This was the first time where I was like, oh shit! Some people are moving into cryptocurrency yeah. as the banks start to collapse. Now, in fairness, that is a subset of stocks especially if you're looking sure. at regional banks and not the S&P 500, right? I yes, think the, I, I'm pretty sure the S&P was down that day too, but I, I don't, I, I got to imagine, I gotta imagine the I am, banking sector was so down. Let me ask you this, and you know that I'm pretty heavily vested in, in these things, so I'm very deeply interested in Bitcoin, but just to, just to act as a stand-in, let us assume that, and based on at least the homework that I've done, which... You know your mileage may vary, but the the S and P has been very highly correlated to Bitcoin and Ethereum for that matter. Yeah, right. Uh, it, these are treated as risk on assets. Yes, and when things go down, people sell, especially when they're most you, risky. When shit. you can sell it whenever you want to yes. sell it, and it's not just market hours. Yada yada yada. What is different this time around? Because I do think there there are two issues with the bet. One is that. And this is this is this happens to everybody, right? You develop a it's not quite a sunk cost fallacy, you develop a confirmation bias, right? right? You begin to find reasons to support your book, yeah. your existing positions. And and just one more thing, and that is I do think the Balaji bet can't be viewed solely as a prediction because people pay attention to him, people purchase or sell based on also, some people do, biologies, predictions, and so on. And it makes me think of this section in Liar's Poker by Michael Lewis. It's the book that made Michael Lewis famous. It's a great book. It's about, I think it's mostly about, mostly about bond trading. And there was some like big swinging dick, top dog inside, I think it was Solomon Brothers. And he bought some position. He was like, the market's going up. 4x and he bought like five hundred thousand dollars worth and it started to go down and people were laughing and he had lost a bet and people were making fun of him and he's like oh yeah and then he bought like 500 million dollars worth of it and the market <laughs> freaked <laughs> out yeah. and went sh sh skyrocketing because they're like oh my god somebody knows something we don't know so he was able to move the market right right he made a prediction but he also moved the market and i think that I don't think Balaji's bet. Balaji it, can't it, move the market. It's too big. Well, I'm not saying he can't move the market, but it was it, it became global news, mm. right? Yes. You don't think he can move the market even if it affects larger institutional players and so on? No. I'm not saying that Balaji single-handedly can move the market, but I think it's I don't think it's fair to say 
that it has zero impact on the buying and selling behaviors. Of oh, people. no doubt. I mean, I think anyone can temporarily move the market. If, if Tim Ferriss tweets out, oh my God, one of my best friends, an insane researcher, just found a hole in Bitcoin. We're all fucked. <laughs> You know, I have a right. I have a strong feeling that there would be some movement <laughs> in prices, yeah, yeah. right? Like, but you're saying it would recalibrate. Right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Mm-hmm. There's just too much volume going through it every single day. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. Like, if there, it's a hype cycle, right? Yeah. Like, J- Kramer's going to talk about it. Like, if people are going to. It's going to spread. Yeah. It's going to have its 48 hour window, and then there's going to be a bump, which we I think we saw, and then it'll just recalibrate from there. So, but I thought it was irresponsible to make that type of public pronouncement. I would be shocked if it gets to a million by mid June. I don't know if that it's irresponsible. I just think it's like, there are, you're peop- making there, a are there are people who cannot afford to take their savings and put into Bitcoin who are going to do it because of something like that. Well, the good news has gone up since he said that. So they're yeah. up regardless. Well, yeah, it's one thing to get into a position. <laughs> yeah. That's a as great you point. famously know, cause you're, you're like, I'm buying this. And as then you, you never tell me when you fucking sell you things. more famously know, <laughs> we can talk about your Bitcoin oh, investing. Oh, <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah good Lord. All right. Yeah. So let's, let's, let's move on from there. So I have some fun stuff to talk about. Let's do it. I guarantee you, you're going to love this next little segment. All right. I'm excited. Okay. Yes. We talked about New Year's resolutions before. Oh God. But I <laughs> have one that I didn't tell you about. Okay. I want to show you something here. Tim's All right. You've seen this for the first time. You can go ahead and read this for the audience here. What does that say? It says ABC letter tracing practice workbook for kids. Ages what? Ages three plus. Okay. And then when you open the first page, what does it say? Oh, Kevin Rose, age 45, February 9th, 2023. And then what do you see from, from here? Oh, you're letter tracing. Yes. So I'm learning how to write with my right hand. Amazing. <laughs> this is incredible. It's pretty, it's pretty shaky. Your, your it end, is a you, little shaky. Your ends are a little shaky. You can see that I'm having some issues here. <laughs> I please, Love, stop laughing in the background. My wife is like dying laughing. She, she, <laughs> it's so good. It's funny. It's she, funny. She didn't know about this. This is the first she's hearing of it, by all the right, way. All right, all right. This is great. So I, I'm I, I have started to learn how to write with my right hand. Yeah. And I decided I can see these cute bunnies and acorns and it's getting a little mushrooms better, right? and puppies making it interesting. So, you know, <laughs> I'm just now getting started. I got a ways to go. But, you know, this is one of those things where I was watching my kids do it and I'm watching their brains kind of activate as yeah. they're like learning how to trace and how to and Zelda's really actually her letters were flopped and turned around at one point. Now they're straight. That's and, that's what I did. You did the same thing? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I still do it. Dysgraphia. My letters end up backwards and upside down and stuff when I write some letters yeah. in, in handwriting. Sometimes I skip a letter and then I kind of back and rewrite it. I don't know what the fuck that is, but that's something I got. I don't know. I get too crazy and I just like jump yeah, early letter. onset dementia. Okay. Sure. <laughs> Great. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but the thing here is, is, you know, there's no, I have no scientific reason other than to say, I realize that this is activating somewhere in my brain, something new. Yeah. And it's just like one of those things where I'm left-handed. So yeah. I've always smudged the shit out of everything I do. Yeah, totally. It's just like a, a streak of ink across the page because <laughs> my hand, and I was like, you know what? My kids are learning. Why don't I learn at the same time? And so that's something I started. That's recently. awesome. Anyway, I thought you'd you enjoy it. Music. Yeah. It's fun. You just like, actually my hand gets really fatigued and so I have to start, you know? So I set a timer for 10 minutes and then I just go to town and like start doing my my numbers and my letters. And then it's like, I got two workbooks in my office. That's amazing. Yeah, it's just, I, I thought you would like I it because as a lifelong learner, like yeah, this totally. is something that you'd be into. Um, so I'm totally into it. And Do you I, know what it's doing for me? Is it like helping my, a certain part oh, of my brain? Daria would know. Daria has... Daria, She's the neuroscience. So. Yeah, Daria would have more credibility discussing this in any capacity. There, There is something kind of similar that... When did you start this? Just at the beginning of the year. Have you tried writing with your left hand? I have because I've broken so many things so many times. So I, when I shattered my right wrist one of several times, I had to do all my writing in school with my left hand. And for the first week, it was terrible. I was also just thrown into baptism by fire because it was like, okay, now you get to write for like several hours a day with your non-dominant hand. <laughs> so yeah. I just got crushed. So are you good? Are you, can you? Oh, I don't think I'm good. So Especially because left-handed extras. is, I, I mean, I, I say it's weird. I'm sure right-handed is equally weird for you, but just like the whole like hook claw. The hook, yeah, the claw. So I wanted to pull up the name of an artist who got me back into penciling. 
And she was not aware of this, but she published a book that I ended up grabbing, which was, unbeknownst to me, a guide to her toolkit and approach to much of her artwork. 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 <laughs> artwork. Artwork. I'm so tired, folks. It's not any booze. I slept terribly last night. Maybe we'll talk about my low back. I have all sorts of low back issues. I had low back this morning, so, dude. This woman, I, I might be pronouncing her first name incorrectly, but I'm going to say Eliza Ivanova. And her account on Instagram is Eliza, E L E E Z A. One of my favorite artists out there. She's spectacular. Can I see some more stuff? Yeah, yeah. Formerly at Pixar. And her ability to draw animals and portraits is wow, just spectacular. Is and wow. there's a certain like surreal oh, I love this. feel to it. And she's, you see what she's using here. I'm showing an Instagram video. She's using a smudging stick instead of, say, cross hatching, which can be really rough on the wrists and the hands to very quickly create amazing pieces of art. And she has a number of books. I bought her most recent book, which gives sort of an overview of her technique and approach to artwork. And so I have been like this type of stuff, for instance, rather than starting with sort of a stick figure or a, not quite mannequin, that's not the word I'm looking, maquette, not maquette, but rather than starting with the bones of someone, starting with the the outline of the figure, mm. then adding wow, the shading, so good. then adding the details and going back and forth, it's so Don't intricate. you just wish you had that skill set? I mean, I, you're really good, but, I, but that, you're not that oh, good. Oh, she's better. Yeah, she's obviously much better. Do you have a screen I mean, protector look, on, by look, the way? Yeah, I do. I can't see it a certain so angle. So this is a new thing. All right. You want to hear a story? You're going to love this. You're right. protecting your... Protecting my screen. Yeah. But, well, this is a privacy screen. Yeah. And I went to a restaurant here in LA and sit down at the bar because that's what's, what's available. Huge bar. It's like 75 feet wide. By yourself? Yeah. Was yeah, this a date? I just, no, I just finished a workout. Why don't you just text me up when you're doing shit like this? I didn't come join you for a drink. That's horseshit. You're always super busy. But we're in the same neighborhood. All right. All right. I will text you next Please time. Please do. Seriously. Yeah. Yeah. So I had done a workout. I finished. And then I was just like, hey, looking for a place to eat. What can you guys recommend? Ended up at this restaurant. And then I was sitting there, ordered my food, having a great time. Beautiful venue. Like flirting a little bit with the waitress. Like that's not going to go anywhere. But it was fun. Like she was... Just like good vibes. Yeah. It was, was, it was just, it felt good. Waitress, right. Yeah, and good, like, good it was, what was that? It was a good, a good yeah, it was just good vibes. Fun, like yeah. it wasn't, it clearly wasn't going to go anywhere, but it was just, it was just fun. And then somebody comes and sits right next to me. There's like 20 empty seats in oh, the bar. Jesus. I had this one when I was pissing one time yeah, at a movie theater. Okay. All right. All right. Where there was 30 urinals and yeah. a dude walks all the way down and stands right next to me. And I'm yeah, like, all right. yeah. So, yeah. Thanks, so, buddy. So sat right next to me and ultimately ended up, being a fan of mine and he was very cool but the fact that he was sitting right next to me meant i felt very self-conscious looking at my phone i was like if i look at anything on my phone or i try to text someone or anything this is incredibly visible to everyone around me and so i ended up getting a privacy screen for my iphone which is fantastic i mean such a simple solution it also protects yeah, it the screen works quite well and well, there you have it. So that's 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 my story about the privacy. That's the, my story <laughs> cool, about the cool privacy story, screen. Bro. Yeah, cool, <laughs> cool story, bro. Yeah, Jesus Christ. Do you, have a, you know, do you, let, a, do you have a name for the privacy screen so these people can buy it if they look at one? I do. Tim Tim's this privacy is, screens. This is Tim's privacy screens dot com. It works quite well. I'm actually kind of shocked because I can't see shit from you, and I'm sitting like a foot from you. Yeah, I really can't see anything. Yeah, on it's your amazing. Screen. It's, it's amazing. It's really helpful. So let me let me try to find this, and it's gonna. All right, I'll start with the next story. There, while there, you're, there you're is a well. Hold on. There's a brand. It starts with a B. It's not Belcom. Belsky. It's not Belsky. <laughs> Belkin. Belkin. Yeah. Yeah. Belkin. Thank you, Daria. So I think it's I think I initially was looking for a Belkin because those are well known and I ended up being unable to get it quickly so I just have something made in China that is a similar design. So there you have it. But the the key term is iPhone protector slash privacy screen. And if you search for that, you'll find something. All right. <laughs> now that your privacy is covered, no, let's they got move that on to my next story, which is Nintendo. Enough about enough about you. Let's talk about me. <laughs> so, 
Let me ask you a question. When do you think Nintendo was founded? Oh, I have maybe some unfair advantages here. I'm going to say 1880. Yes. How did you know that? Was I, was I close? Yeah, it's in the late 1800s. Yeah. Yeah. Because 1839. No, it was like later 1800. Uh, well, 1800s. It. It so the reason I know that, this is good. actually, you probably don't even know this. No, I know. So there is a Japanese card game. There's tiny little cards. They're, they're like half the size of a business card. And one of my favorite games I played when I was an exchange student is called Hanafuda. Hanafuda has these beautiful drawings, and it's simply put, it's a it's a matching game in in a sense. And Nintendo became famous for first making these card games. Oh, crazy! Can you still buy them and they're like collectible? Yeah, you can still That's get them. So cool! It's super cool. Super Does super it say cool. Say Nintendo on them. It yeah. must be in Japanese. It's though, in so Japanese. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Is there little Mario characters? <laughs> no Mario characters, but yeah. <laughs> that would be amazing. Nintendo. I don't know what the nin is. Ten is heaven, and then do is like place of. So like shokudo is a cafeteria, like the, the I thought food, do is food the way. place. The, it's a homonym, so do is the same. Do is the same, like aikido, do, like is, is the, the way. Is of, the way. Yeah. Different character. Okay. Yeah. A katakana. So. No kanji. Kanji, different yeah. kanji, yeah, different okay. different character. But nin is probably sekinin no nin kana. Yeah, well, anyway, we can come back to that. But All right, speaking of Nintendo. So Nintendo. <laughs> as you know, my my firstborn is named Zelda. Mm -hmm. There's a new Legend of Zelda, The Tears of the Kingdom, opening May 12th, which is soon. That is soon. I am very excited for this release. And I started playing the old original Zelda like the very first one. Cool. So you can play it on the Switch. They have emulators now that you can get yeah. on the Switch. Now the Switch has the traditional Switch controllers, but Nintendo released the original, and these are charging, so they slide off. Check this out. This is the original Nintendo controller. That's cool. That you can get. So oh, that's awesome. Yeah, exactly. So it's this the, brings back so many memories. That's official from Nintendo, not because you could always yeah. find like the clone USB Nintendo controllers yeah. that with the fakes and all that. That has the same feel. Like you push the buttons. Yeah. Like okay. Everything about it is oh, legit. Man. And that's, then they charge when you slide them on the side of the switch. They charge. That's and brilliant. USB. It's so that's cool. That's brilliant. Isn't that awesome? That's super awesome. So they have their past now where you can get all the original Nintendo games. That's and fun. It's crazy. I was on the marketplace and, and you know, my dad's passed away. And one of the things that I remember as a child is there was the original Nintendo pinball game. And yeah. my dad used to watch me play and he, would, he had actually had a little tiny TV for me so I could like play next to him as he's watching his shows or whatever. And uh, I remember he never wanted to play any games with me. Like he wasn't really like he was an older dad and he didn't really like get into Nintendo. But when pinball came up, he's like, okay, let me the, grab the controller. And so he played Nintendo with me. So when I saw that, I was like, oh my God, like yeah. you get to, I mean, it's what so nostalgia. much nostalgia. Yeah, exactly. So much nostalgia. I'll just teach a word for, for folks who may be interested in Japanese. They use it a lot more than we say nostalgia, but they would say natsukashi, natsukashi. Ah, natsukashi na. That's sort of got the same feel as nostalgic, but they they use it kind of like saudade in in Brazilian Portuguese, but it's uh, roughly like ah, oh, like how nice, like ah, oh, that's really nostalgic. That brings back the memories. There was a, a blog post that I saw where it was like twenty five words that exist in Japanese that don't have english meanings you know yeah and they're so beautiful they like they nice capture ones. these like amazing just yeah. like moments in time like there was this one that was like the sunlight as it falls between branches branches yes Kom komorebi yes komorebi yes. is like dappled sunlight coming through tree branches <laughs> and leaves so good it's so good so amazing like they have a word for yeah, that komorebi. that's so oh, amazing yeah super beautiful so oh, so i was i was in tokyo yeah, let's talk so about it. celebrated my 10 year wedding anniversary. Congratulations there. again. Yes. That was amazing. And we had a, a ton of fun. Daria met me out there. We did a Moonbirds meetup. So we had over 100 Japanese speaking Moonbirds collectors out there, which was challenging and awesome at the same time. <laughs> and then Henry, yeah. my Zen instructor here, Shookman. Shookman, here in the United States, introduced me to the head of his lineage of Zen who I got to go out and meet with and sit down with and have 
to go to karaoke. Private. Yeah, exactly. We're not <laughs> drinking and just do karaoke together all night long. No, but we 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 had a little private gathering and sit down and did a, a, a private. Did he lay his hands on, on you? Exercise the demons? There was, there was. No, he helped me with my practice and game. He speaks uh, his English is quite good, and uh, it was, it was very intimidating. Very intimidating. I bet. This is the, the that's he, the that's head of actually Sambo Zen, which is like yeah, Sambo, a big Sambo. That's right. Yeah, you know, three treasures, like a big uh-huh. lineage of Zen. And I'm sitting here with this guy, <laughs> you know, and he's just like asking me very pointed questions like about what? my intention what, in Zen. What is your intention with my daughter? Yeah, you know, more or less. <laughs> but it was like very cutting questions, dude. Like, like what? Like a surgeon just coming in and just like. I don't know if I should say the things because it's, it's this <laughs> private interview, you know? <laughs> he gave me all the shit with not being able to come up with the no. brand of privacy protector. Okay. All right. No, it's just, <laughs> it's just like, it, I'll give he asked you me all these amazing questions. Now I can't talk. About I'll them. give you an example. It's like, it, he's like, it's more or less like, why are you here? Like, where are you? You know how in Zen they have these, these phrases, we've talked about these cons before. You've yeah. done interviews with Henry and thank you for doing those. Like yeah. where it's like these moments where a really good Zen master can come in and look at a student and know kind of exactly the little nudge they need to give them. There's yeah. these like moments where they, they call it like, there's these stories in Zen where they grab your coat and yank you in a certain direction just to kind of get you to like snap, like wake up, like, yeah. you know, this moment just boom, they want you to pop. Yeah. And it was very much that, like, why are you here? What do you, what do you want from this? Like, boom, boom, boom. Like this rapid fire, like I think the guy on the street when I walked back to my Airbnb in Venice asked <laughs> yeah, me those questions. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, but less fentanyl driven. But yeah, so it was amazing. It was very special. I hear the Zen masters have cut back on their fentanyl a lot. Yeah, this guy was operating in a different way. So what plane. did that feel like for you? Like, what was, why did you want to do it, first of all? Because... I just, you know, Henry had said such great things about him that, you know, and Henry is, is he will never say this publicly, but I believe he is one. I'll say it for him. (laughs) No, I will, because I think it's important. Like he, he's, he's such a a modest guy that like Henry is one of, I I think it's like five or so like fully sanctioned Zen masters in this lineage. And Mm. that's a big deal when there's, you know, hundreds of teachers in this, in this realm. So you know, this is his master, his his teacher. Mm. If you get a chance to take that meeting, you take it, you know? And so, you know, I went in there. You're not like, nah, I'm busy. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to try on some new shoes. I'm too too busy (laughs) going going to try some fancy Japanese coffee, but, which I did, which is amazing. Cafe Mamea out there is fantastic. But honestly, though, the one thing that I I took away from it for for people that, that I will share is that one of the things that he asked me is he's like, how, how often do you practice and how long do you practice? And I said, you know, I practice 25 minutes a day, probably five days a week. And he goes, what about the other two days? And I go, well, I got a startup. I got this and I got that. And he goes, I don't care. And I'm paraphrasing here, but he goes, I don't care if you practice five minutes a day. He goes, don't miss a day. Don't break a day. Hmm. Continue to do it. Don't, don't miss a day. Hmm. And since then, I have not missed a day. And I will say it's, it's kind of amazing because even if you can sit down for five minutes it just keeps that continuity going and, yeah. it, and, it, and it actually keeps me at a, a slightly elevated more, I don't know. It keeps the commitment stronger. Like it's, it feels better. And that was, that was sound advice. It's great advice. Dario, can I trouble you for just a little bit of water, please? <laughs> Thank you so much. Should we, what? Wait, what's, what's water? You can do it. Hold on. <laughs> Hold on. Don't tell me. Yeah, you got it. Uh, oishi, it's so oishi. <laughs> what oishi? No, that's it's that's delicious. tasty. Yeah, I know the water's tasty. What mizu, 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 omizu, omizu. Yep, omizu, like mizu tani, mizu. There, hey. there are a lot of mizus out there. So let's stay on the Japanese kick for a yeah. second. This is a book in front of me, which I'm just digging into. <laughs> Japanese death poems. Let's talk about Japanese death poems. I did not actually, I'm embarrassed to admit, know this was a thing. This was given to me by a friend who has spent a lot of time in the military and has developed a rather 
unique perspective, unique perspectives on death from, I suppose, the vantage point of a lay person, right, of a civilian. And so this book is, I'll, I'll just read the quote on the back. This is one of the, the blurbs. A wonderful introduction to the Japanese tradition of Jise. This volume is crammed with exquisite, spontaneous verse and pithy, often hilarious descriptions of the eccentric and committed monastics who wrote the poems. So these poems are written on the verge of death. And literally the mm. subtitle is written by Zen monks and haiku poets on the verge of death. Yes. <laughs> and uh, it's incredibly well researched. You have not just the English versions, you have the introduction and all the context, you have the Japanese, and then you have footnotes describing what these various words might mean, what the metaphors allude to. And it's really just a phenomenal window into an aspect of Japanese culture that I had no exposure to. I would have expected that I would have been exposed to this before, but I am I'm looking forward to diving into this and I've I've already read perhaps the first ten pages. So this is Japanese Death Poems. So fun. By Tuttle Publishing, compiled in with an introduction by Yoel Hoffman. So I have a handful, I don't know if I've told you this, but I have a handful of haiku books that I've read by Japanese masters. Yeah. And one of the things I always felt was just so beautiful about them is they always include their kind of death poems, like at the very end. Hmm. It's oftentimes like on their deathbed when they're about to pass, like what is the last thing that they wrote down, right? And it's often in haiku form if they're a haiku master, right? Yeah, totally. And so it, it's just, it's beautiful stuff. Yeah, there's some really Japanese stuff in here, right? Like this is died 1698 for not honoring my parents while I lived in my last hour. I feel remorse, right? <laughs> that is very super Japanese. The autumn hues of knotweed seem like cups of wine. Yeah. Are you a big fan of haiku? I am. This is my first time really being exposed to a lot of Japanese and it does sound better in Japanese. There's a certain cadence to it. I'm not going to get the pronunciation quite perfectly here, but it's like if you have, okay, so Hakuro is this person, died on the 19th day of the 12th month, 1766. So the English, and I'm going to fuck this up in Japanese, so I apologize to any Japanese speakers out there, but the English, just listen to the sounds, like the cadence. So the English is an ailing mallard, falls through the chilly night and teeters off. Okay. But then the the Japanese is yamu kari no yosamu ni orite obotsu kana. Right? So it just like has it has a cleaner mm -hmm. crisper cadence to it, which doesn't mean you shouldn't do the English, but this is my first time being exposed to a lot of haiku in Japanese, mm -hmm. which is fun for me. Number yeah, 1 because it's very hard for me to decipher in many cases, but they have a beautiful sound to them. So that's awesome. I have to pick that book up. Death poems. <laughs> yeah. There's a great poem about haiku and about the masters called three simple lines. Okay. Have you ever read that? No, it's a fantastic book that is written by a Zen practitioner that covers a lot of the, the Zen masters of haiku and along with a really beautiful personal story. So hmm. uh, definitely worth it. Very short read. Definitely worth picking up along with this. Yeah. I mean, how Japanese relate to death, which is something I have some exposure to, but not to the poems, this particular Jisei format tells you a lot about how they live. I mean, it, it, it does provide sort of a prism through which you can appreciate how they navigate a lot of life as well. Right, like in, in addressing the final hours and thinking about dying, death, the path to death. When you get a better understanding of that, many of the things that you observe in Japanese culture make more sense in a way. Have you ever done an escape room? Yes. You have? Yes. How many? Multiple. Really? Multiple. Yes. What does that mean? Like a hundred? Like four. Four. All right. So but the, the, they're so the, stupid. The fatigued way. So I, all right, they're so stupid, he says. They're horrible. I did my first escape room today. I had a fucking blast. I don't know what's wrong with you. You're getting old and boring. No, it's just like you're going in there and it's like, what are you doing? Like, 
you can get out if you want to. Are they really locking you up? No. It's called a game, Kevin. Yeah, I know. But like, <laughs> when you're playing Zelda, <laughs> you're trying to like do shit in a video game. You don't actually need to do those things. No, but I just... <laughs> Dari can explain it. Like, you know what I'm talking about? Like you go in there and you're, they lock you up. It's a little room and they're like, we really quick grab the book and like open up the book and turn to chapter 12 and people are yelling shit out. And you're just like, I don't want to do this. I just want to have a drink. All right. Like, <laughs> so I'm going to provide a contrast in styles here. So Kevin, who got so outraged that I implied that he drank alcohol earlier. <laughs> so, no, I just, all my friends want me to do it sober. And I'm like, why are we doing this sober? And they're like, can get through it faster we could break a world record I'm well like, yeah i look doing it in a hyper competitive way i think is is probably not my jam but i had the chance to do escape rooms for the first time today i went to this place called escape revolution which is here in la elon lee who is one of the co-founders of exploding kittens was kind enough to invite me i don't want to name other people who are there because maybe they don't want to be named but it was a small group and i thought it was absolutely fantastic you have an hour there's some type of pretext or or story there's a narrative arc so in our first instance and i'm not going to give away any of the tools so i won't provide any teasers but we had a real armored car that's locked in a garage that's cool the money. and uh, we you have to you're, you're robbers and you need to get the money out of the car but the mechanic who set up all the security systems ran off because the police are on the way so you have 60 minutes to figure it out. And we had a blast. And this place is, is built in such a way that the set design and the sound effects and the entire experience makes it, I don't want to say cinematic, but it's just a very compelling way to become immersed in a story. And you have to collaborate. I also, part of what made it fun is that I have a game designer, right? In Alan Lee, I had a number of other people who were very accustomed to mechanics of different types, not car mechanics, but like game mechanics and so on. A woman who had done almost 2000 escape rooms herself, oh, Jesus. which is, which is all to say it was a cool group of yeah. people to they were interact it. with. Well, they were into it, but then there were two newbies. I was one of those two newbies who'd never done this before. And then the second one was a jailbreak and we were locked in cells, which were like legitimate cells with. <laughs> was that solo? What are you talking like, about? Like, did you have to figure out how to get out of your own cell? It was three people to a cell and then you needed to figure it out. I kind of wish it was solo. Like, I don't know. I just have this hard thing where it's like, we're all yelling shit. And I'm just like, can we just like relax for a I second? I don't know what your group was like. There's no yelling. Maybe in my, there's the no yelling. <laughs> there's no yelling in this group. Yeah, no, this, this group. Do you like it? Yeah, Daria doesn't like it either. All right. She hates games. But that's, Daria hates games. It's one of those things where I just, I, I, I have, maybe I haven't had the right experience because the ones in Portland were kind of jank. I don't remember much. I just remember that we went in there and they were just like shit hidden in like little bookcases and stuff. And I'm just like, why am I looking through these bookcases? Like there's other things to do. I've got emails that I haven't checked. <laughs> Like there's like a lot of shit going <laughs> on. Oh my god! <laughs> but it's, it oh, felt like you, work. It felt like work. It felt where, like work. Where I'm like, why am I working to figure out this thing when it's not even a thing? Well, I mean, you don't need to work out in the gym to like outrun hyenas on the street. So what are you doing <laughs> in the gym? Well, I mean that that you can actually get a, a physical like good feeling from guns. So. Sun, sun's out, guns out, show, guns out, yeah, that kind right. of thing. Sun's, <laughs> guns out. Well, right. I'm glad you had a good time. I had a, I had a fucking great time. And one other thing I did this weekend, which I'd never experienced, and if people have the chance, I recommend, is experiencing high fidelity immersive sound for the first time, like actually listening to music. Mm in a store or a location where they're paying attention to all the variables. Yes. The most I've ever done is really to the extent that I personally can set up a few Sonos speakers in a house. Yeah. That's it. That is, that's as fancy as I have ever gotten. And I was having dinner with a few friends, well, one close friend and a few new friends who are, are professional musicians. And they heard me say this and they were like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Okay, we need to go to a good location and put you in a seat to let you listen to some of the music you think you know. Where did they take you? In super high fidelity. This place called Common Wave. And the staff there were exceptional. We went from 
one setup to another setup to another setup to another setup. And uh, it was spectacular. It was like having a full-blown psychedelic experience in some respects. So for those who may have the opportunity, if you have the opportunity, I really came to appreciate just how much goes into music I thought I knew, but had only listened to at, in hindsight, relatively low bit rates. Yes. And it is just a different experience altogether. Because yeah. this, this came about initially at dinner because I asked somebody at dinner who's a, who's a TV writer, I asked him if he ever watches TV and has trouble immersing himself in TV. And he said, I don't really watch TV. And I was like, well, what do you spend your, your time doing if you're just having fun? He said, I listen to music. And I was like, you listen to music while you're doing something else? Or you listen to music as a dedicated activity? And he said, I listen to music as a dedicated yeah. activity. And I was like, okay, tell me more about that. Yeah, And that's how we ended up. So one thing you might want to consider, uh -huh. I've, I've been down this path a couple of times yeah. and there's two ways to approach it. One, you either go high fidelity system for your house yeah, or you go really high end headphones. Mm -hmm. And I recently realized that back even just two years ago to do a high end headphone setup required its own dedicated amp. Yeah. It was like the whole, there's a whole rig that you have to get. Yeah. More recently, there are now lossless, over-the-air audio codecs that can go to headphones mm. that sound amazing. So Over-the-air, you're saying Bluetooth? Yeah. So I, I got a, a Bowers & Wilkins. I think it's the PX7. It's something along those lines. And these are sub $1,000, but they're still pricey. I mean, yeah. I think they're like $800 or something like that. And they can do a lossless codec from your iPhone to your headphones. And so there's no bit degradation in quality. Mm -hmm. And Apple Music now supports lossless as well. Mm -hmm. And so you can listen to insanely high fidelity audio mm. and just sit back and relax and enjoy the music. And the headphones, I mean, you'll, you'll see the reviews out there, but they're, they're fantastic. Huh. Okay, well, yeah, that would be substantially less expensive. Oh my God. <laughs> Dude, I've seen some setups, and I'm sure you have too, or you yeah. talk to these people. I mean, you're you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars in. Oh, it's easily. Like, I mean, yeah. if you really want to get up to the nerdiest of the nerdy and yeah. the most expensive of the, of the expensive, and I, I do think there's a dramatic yeah, drop we're talking off. About wine there's and all a that point earlier. of there's a yeah. point of diminishing returns, but there are people out there who spend you know hundred thousand dollars on a cable. Yeah, right? that, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's you can get as expensive as you want to get, but. I would say the in-home systems are certainly going to be more oh. expensive than the headset you're describing. It's funny. We met with someone recently that was an audio video person. So Daria and I are, you know, we're in an apartment now and we're, we're moving into a home at some point here in the future. And there was this person that was like, Hey, I can come do your home audio video stuff. And like, I literally told the person, I was like, I just want Sonos. I just want Sonos and a decent pair of speakers. Yeah. Because for me, like, I don't want to spend insane amounts of money when I could just put on an amazing pair of headphones and kick back anywhere in the house yeah. and, you know, either read a book or just relax and like listen to better than I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to spend a, several hundred thousand dollars yeah. when you can probably spend like, you know, 10 grand and have an amazing setup, right? Yeah. Like it's going to sound great. Your movies, all that stuff's going to sound fantastic. You just, I don't know. For me, audio is not one of those things that I want to blow money on. Yeah, well, you know, I've got my relationship with my replica and yeah, you got single life ahead of me, so I can just <laughs> sit in a house by myself in a dark corner listening to you know, Pink Floyd crying yeah. and eating ho-hos. As your replica whispers to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta try this replica now. Is it that good now? Uh, I, I I haven't dared set foot. You haven't you haven't even dabbled. It's like, no. like hey, replica. No, no, no. I haven't. I have not. I have not. Although a few <laughs> friends have. Really? Uh, they like it? Do they get into sexual encounters with the replica? I haven't heard that yet. Okay. I don't think it's I don't think it's there. Okay. It'll get there. Oh, I'm sure it'll if, get there. If they're not gonna build it, they're silly because like somebody's gonna build that in very short order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm just imagining Neuralink type. I don't think virtual sex, which will ultimately debilitate all males on the planet, once that is actually a real thing, but nothing will get done ever by any man ever again. But there's been a lot of attention paid to haptic suits and that type of feedback yeah. with, say, VR. Adam Ghazali loves this. Yeah, haptic suits. 
they just all they're it's I like find, the thing we always bring up adam in every podcast <laughs> <laughs> that's right we talked about his chin hair last time <laughs> the haptic suits i always have found interesting but kind of dissatisfying because it doesn't replicate your human experience right it feels like something vibrating on your chest right by and large You're like i'm wearing a suit yeah. i'm wearing a suit that's that's <laughs> right <laughs> Dari's doing chest in air quotes <laughs> well so okay let's say i had like a haptic glove on my schlong right it's still not going to feel like the real mccoy it's just not going to have you tried all the crazy things they have out now because they have those like ones that look like they have different types of materials that are supposed to feel more realistic i have not what what are we talking about well they have like in those concrete terms in, in concrete terms. Okay. I've heard that they have those like those skin like ones that like they this locked down and they're supposed to feel really You should work in a Foley studio. That was great. But they're they're supposed to lock down and feel really realistic. Like that's okay. you've not so, you don't act like you've never heard of that shit. You know more about this stuff than I do. I don't. You, I would look, look, let me let me just be clear. I would try that. Like I have nothing against it. I would try it. I just think at some point I'm going to be like, I feel like I'm like boning a Mattel toy or something. Right. Right. So the, the where I was going with the Neuralink is I think rather than the haptic suit, there's probably going to be quite a bit. Well, at some point I could envision just having a direct link in yeah. where you can simulate. I mean, I guess generate really the type of sensation that you would have. So I think sex. it's going to be the opposite. And, so here's what okay. I think is going to happen. What I think, think we're going to have essentially AI that comes in and we'll have a relationship with, and then earpieces will go into real humans that will play the like role. Like her. That's exactly what happened in her. You oh, remember? Is that, is that what happened at the end? I don't remember. Yeah. That. Yeah. So they arranged to have like a, like a, a normal person come person in. come in like right. this woman comes in yes she's got an earpiece and he's got an earpiece and it'll play and the, the idea thing. is they don't communicate he's just communicating with scarlett johansson who's his ai i gotta watch this movie again. and it's then been decades since oh, i've seen it and then they have yeah they have sex and he has a camera i think they had cameras so that she, like the ai could also see what was going on and comment on that Oh yeah, Dory is saying that the Diamond Age yeah. book by Neil Stevenson, yeah, is supposed to be VR. the VR is basically played out by like actual actors, and like that's a job. <laughs> I've heard great things about the Diamond Age. I have never read it, but Neil Stevenson, author of Snow Crash, some people are yeah. this. My favorite book, actually, really? Cryptonomicon, and a lot of people hate on Cryptonomicon, but I just absolutely yeah. loved it. So I, go I gotta go back and listen to Snow Crash. All right, I think I'm done with my my stuff. You you covered everything. Uh, I feel like I've I've you know we're, we're stopping on the Mattel toys. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we covered. A oh, I have a gift for you. You have a gift. So for me. here's my last story. My last story is that when I was in Tokyo, I realized that you know Lego is obviously a pretty popular phenomenon amongst a, a bunch of my Silicon Valley friends. Actually, it's like a time that you can get off the computer and build Legos. They have something called NanoBlock. Okay. Out in, in Japan, which are really tiny. I don't know how they got around the patent of Legos. <laughs> They're really tiny little baby Legos. And I got you this little oh, castle. Oh, so he made you castle. Look at that. Yeah. It's this little tiny castle. And Thank these are you. Small. They, they do very traditional Japanese structures in, in like, more less they Lego. even say the original micro sized building block. All right. So, anyway, if people want to eBay it or check it out, it's actually really cool because, you know, just recently Lego started adding like things like bonsai trees and stuff like that. When I was walking down the aisles in Tokyo of this store, these nano blocks, they had all these traditional, beautiful Japanese structures. And so, if you're looking for something, if you're into Lego or know somebody that's into, into this whole thing. And I have a lot of friends that have built like, you know, back to the future cars and every other Lego that's out there, check out nano block because they have a bunch of stuff that has very, you know, obviously Japanese influence that you might be really into small blocks, big fun. I'm just reading the side here. Chisai wa tanoshii. <laughs> nano block is a micro sized building block designed in Japan since 2008. Fun to build, attractive to display, interesting to collect. Something tells me that Lego was around before 2008. <laughs> yeah, it was definitely <laughs> around before 2008. Like the original 2008. 
Anyway, you yeah. do this Thank will be you. something to get off great. the computer and just like do it's it's tiny. Oh, yeah. So it's a yeah, yeah. like little fun little thing. I got a couple for friends, so that was Yeah, my- girlfriend, I built you a Himeji castle with nanoblock. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. That's my favorite. <laughs> you know how to please me. <laughs> all right, right on that with note. That, <laughs> God save us all. Yes. All right. <laughs> Thank you everyone. This Thanks, has been everybody. Fun.